From artificial leaves which suck carbon out of the air to mimicking volcanic eruptions to prevent global warming. Is no idea too bold when it comes to climate change? Welcome to Roundtable with me, David Foster. Think big, think very, very big. That's the message from scientists in the UK who are planning a new research centre in their quest to stop climate change. Ideas that were once thought too far-fetched are now being reconsidered, along with newer and even bolder concepts. In the battle against the ongoing climate crisis, scientists are coming up with creative ideas that just might become solutions. Researchers in California are trying to modify plants and crops by splicing up their genes with a new compound that makes them absorb more carbon dioxide, supercharging what nature already does. Other ideas being developed include artificial leaves to convert CO2 into fuel, Another proposes greening areas of the ocean with algae to remove carbon dioxide from the air. Refreezing the Earth's polar regions might sound like science fiction, but it's being seriously considered. And sucking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or carbon capture, is also getting major funding. Known as geoengineering, such futuristic techniques could become a reality if scientists can figure out a way of implementing them. But critics urge caution, warning against the unknown effects on both people and the environment. Others point to the lack of time and funding for these projects. So if humans can't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, can we design our way out of a pending global catastrophe? So let's get talking. Join us from the Netherlands. We have Dr. Jesse Reynolds, an expert in climate engineering at UCLA, with me in the studio. Dr. Matthew Watson, scientist and researcher at the University of Bristol School of Earth Sciences. Angus Gillespie with us too, senior consultant at the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute. And Mike Charles, head of policy at Friends of the Earth. I want to give people an idea of, of what geoengineering actually is during this programme. So, so, Matthew, first of all, volcanoes, one of your specialities, mm -hmm. about the hottest thing you can imagine anywhere, and yet they can help us stop global warming. That's right. Well, Help me. Um, um, so, so volcanoes produce last, large amounts of uh, a gas called sulphur dioxide that reacts in the atmosphere to make very, very small particles and they scatter sunlight back out into space. Uh, that means there's less energy coming into the Earth's surface, more is reflected out into space, which has the effect of slightly cooling the planet. OK, well, volcanoes won't go off at anybody's command. So how can you use this if we want to take it a stage further? So, so one of the flavours of, of geoengineering that we might discuss is this idea of uh, artificially emulating the effects by injecting material ourselves into the atmosphere. You'd, you'd get the material up to about 20, 25 kilometres, you'd spray it out over the atmosphere, and it would have the same effect. Jesse, is this the sort of thing they're talking about at the Cambridge Institute when they talk about refreezing the poles because they're talking about pushing water droplets up into the clouds, I think. Yeah, the, there's some debate about uh, how to define these terms, what geoengineering is and, and isn't. Uh, if we think about it as large scale intentional interventions in the Earth systems to counteract climate change. And I think that these proposed methods to perhaps uh, slow down or even reverse the melting of uh, polar ice uh, um, might follow under such a definition, yeah. But the problem is at the moment, unless we use these extraordinary methods, um, what we're doing in trying to reduce carbon emissions is, is just too slow. We have to adopt more radical policies. Is that the theory? Yeah, it's, it's, it's essential that uh, cutting greenhouse gas emissions remains a high priority, uh, the top priority for preventing and reducing climate change. But it's increasingly clear that these efforts just can't be enough to prevent uh, uh, dangerous climate change and to stay within the limits that the world agreed on in, its, uh, in the Paris Agreement from a few years ago. So it's essential that we 
uh, consider that we research uh, a wide array of possible uh, uh, supplements, things that can help us uh, stay within our targets. OK, we'll talk about the possible downsides a little bit later on. Uh, but your feelings, my from Friends of the Earth, about the idea of introducing artificial means, perhaps, to prevent a natural, well, an unnatural catastrophe, if you like. I think there's a world of difference between stopping polluting the planet, which is, is we all agree, is the first thing we need to do, to stop those carbon emissions coming out. Uh, sucking carbon pollution out of the atmosphere, uh, which is relatively benign, and we'll use techniques like artificial trees that I'm sure we'll talk about. And then the third level, which is almost like playing God and trying to play with the weather, with a global thermostat firing up particles into, into the atmosphere to try and reflect the sun, that will have unintended consequences to the world's weather itself. We could see changing weather patterns because of, of that. So we're extremely worried about the idea that, uh, as, a, as a species, we think actually we can control the global weather in that, in that way, a bit like acting God. I think the, the focus really has to be on cutting emissions as fast as possible, and nowadays also trying to take as but, much carbon But that, is, that isn't enough, is it? Well, we're not yet at the stage where if we take carbon out of the atmosphere, carbon pollution out of the atmosphere through afforestation or artificial trees or, or the like, and cutting the mitigation, we can avoid that 1.5 degree warming threshold that the scientists have said we shouldn't mm. breach. If we don't take action soon, then we're in bigger troubles and we need to look perhaps at more dangerous solutions. Our fear is that as soon as those more dangerous solutions are at a higher risk, solutions like the volcano idea get put on the table, there'll be an awful lot of politicians around the world who say, hey, that looks a lot cheaper yeah. Yeah. than reducing carbon. We're going to go with that easy option, even though it would introduce large-scale uncertainties in terms of weather disruption around the world. So it's a very dangerous yeah. game to go down that Let's way. talk, um, Angus, if, if we may, about what you and your institute are doing at the moment. You're trying to take carbon dioxide and bury it underground. Um, well, first of all, tell us how successful that is in eliminating carbon dioxide globally, but also then tell us whether, in fact, that, well, there has been criticism, how you react to criticism that, in fact, the Institute should be doing more in other ways, looking at what we've been talking about. Yeah, here. yeah. So, as you rightly say, the purpose of the Institute is to accelerate the deployment of CCS and its commercial viability. CCS carbon, is cap carbon capture and storage. Now, in terms of the impact it's had, I admit it's limited until this stage. There are something like 20 projects in existence today actually taking CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, in terms of its impact... Let's be clear, they're not in the most polluting countries, such as China um, and India. Uh, most of them are in the United States, which, which is not guilt-free when it comes to this, but they're not in the places that are kicking out the most CO2 right now. Not yet, but... Don't lose sight of the fact, David, that CO2 emissions are a global problem. It's not a local problem. So you can almost say, regardless of where the CO2 is taken from, the ultimate impact in tackling global warming is the same. Now, when you think again, your questions about the, the success or otherwise of CCS, I mean, it has been shown over the many years of operation that the CO2 is safely stored in the subsurface. By subsurface, I mean empty oil and gas reservoirs or what were saline aquifers. So it's a safe and secure way of storing CO2 underground. And it's, I would challenge the thought of comparing it to geoengineering. Remember, the CO2, this is where it came from. We're effectively returning to its original source. So rather just, just for those people that can't quite see it, and I'm not sure that I actually can, when you've got one of these carbon capture facilities, it sucks it out of the atmosphere or it takes it from plants that are producing it? How does it work? OK, let me make a division at this stage. So there's industrial carbon capture and storage, and there's what we call direct air capture. Industrial carbon capture and storage, rather than suck the CO2 from the atmosphere, it takes the CO2 from flue gas, from exhaust from an industrial process. So what you do is you reduce the emissions going into the atmosphere. It's a good example of Mike saying this should be the, the priority, is reducing the emissions in the first place. Mm. And then it deposits those in a safe place. Now, there's a technology that's just emerging. We all have great hope for it, direct air capture. So rather than be associated with cement, steel, power generation, these are machines in the open air that literally absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, compress it and store it underground. OK, tweaking? Is this what this is? 
Um, so there's a difference between trying to take carbon dioxide out of a very concentrated stream that's coming uh, out of a, a factory or heavy industry and direct air ca capture. And the challenge, I think, for these guys is that we're putting about 35 billion tonnes of CO2 additionally into the atmosphere every year. Where are you going to put that? I, uh, Mike made a very valid point about the cost of sulphate aerosol injection, and it is cheap, but that's not necessarily a good thing. In fact, I would argue it's not a good thing, but I think direct air, ch air capture might be potentially be prohibitively expensive. I don't think we know that yet, uh, but it's certainly something we need to look at. But you are going to need to develop an industry to bury that CO2 that's about the same size as the extraction industry. And the question is, can we do that faster? So, so we have to look for radical solutions, fake trees, et cetera, et cetera. Are, are there downsides to this? Oh, yeah. Uh, and and, and my, my challenge to everybody that's thinking about this is to, is to try really hard not to become an advocate for one particular technology. If, 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 you're, if you're passionate about something, that's fine, but if you think that nothing else will work and yours is the only solution, I think then we're going to get into trouble. But has anything got you really excited? Um, I, 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 I want... not No. Honestly, no. I'm terrified. I'm terrified of all of these technologies. Um, they all have to be very, very carefully studied, and they all need to be thought of in terms of, in terms of cost and benefit. But we mustn't make the mistake of ignoring what future climate change will... I'm just going to go to Jesse, Jesse on that one. The, the, the dangers of this are, are what? That we don't know what we're playing with. Mike talks about, you know, fiddling with the weather patterns, playing God. Um, are there any that are already proven, or are we all, um, all of us at the same experimental stage? Well, I think it's important to, uh, uh, to emphasize what uh, has been said, is that within this broad category of geoengineering, there's really quite a diversity. And the techniques of, uh, of capturing and removing carbon uh, and storing it perhaps underground, and there's some other proposed methods, um, uh, they, these would pose uh, local environmental risks. Uh, and also some of these methods are presently expensive. That's something that can be reduced over time uh, uh, through innovation. That's quite different from a, a set of methods to reflect some portion of incoming sunlight, such as by mimicking volcanoes. Uh, there, there, there's also a, a, a other methods that we might be able to use to do that. These are sometimes called solar geoengineering methods. And, and this is an entirely different uh, situation. Uh, as Matt got at, part of the problem is that the direct financial costs of mimicking volcanoes looks small enough that uh, that decision making could become a problem instead of getting trying to get the world to uh, uh, to pitch in and everybody needs to do enough like we have with emissions cuts and possibly with carbon removal with solar solar geoengineering the challenge is uh, uh, restraining ourselves so that we don't go too far too fast and trying to get the world on the same page as much as possible yeah, I just wanted to pick up on Matt's points about the, the cost of direct air capture. And uh, it kind of follows on from what Jesse was saying, because ultimately many of these technologies will require commercial investment. So I think the cost of doing this is critical. And in terms of the latest cost of direct air capture, Matt, uh, what I read was we're approaching something like $150 a tonne. Okay. Now, that sounds extreme when I think the European Union emissions trading system trading about 20 euros a tonne. But if the day comes, it has to come, where CO2 regulation really starts to bite. The International Energy Agency, for example, talk about a cost between $100 and $200 a tonne. Suddenly, these technologies start to make sense. They come into the money. Now, for carbon capture and storage... For those that don't understand it, what do you mean by the, the, the cost... Yes. ...hitting so, $200, perhaps? In, in what yep. sense? Yep, so that's a regulatory cost. So when you look so at... So for every tonne of CO2 you produce, you would have to pay a tax? Yeah, so I think the critical thing is indeed to watch how the costs develop, because the fantastic progress that's been made on solar, wind, particularly offshore wind in the UK, we need to see that applied to carbon capture and storage. And I would think, too, to geoengineering potential as well. And so as these costs reduce to a level that they match, or ideally are less than the prevailing cost of regulation, they suddenly become commercial. That's yeah. what we're after. The, the trouble is, guys, um, I'm not putting Angus in one particular box here, but, I mean, 
you, you three here. The trouble is, it's not just the financial cost, it's the, the time that we would have to take to do all of this. We have to do things like burying the carbon dioxide because we, we're in a race against time, aren't we? I think it, if we'd all listened, I think all of us around the table would, would, would wish that we'd listened in 1990 when the first intergovernmental panel on climate change, the world scientists came together and said, look, guys, we've got a problem here. We need to reduce the amount of carbon pollution we put in the atmosphere. If we start now, we can do it a steady, small step by small step by small step every year. And for almost 30 years, the world has failed to listen to the scientists. So now it's not a small, steady, steady, steady stop step. We're talking about a big step every year and much more rapid declines in, in carbon pollution. Now, there are great technologies that can help us. Offshore wind, as Angus said, is much cheaper than it was even five years ago. Solar panels are falling cost, batteries are falling in, in price as well. But we do need to see that large-scale transformation, and that does require us to recognise that there are costs of not doing this. So while they bring costs with them, the costs of not tackling climate change, as we've seen in the floods in Mozambique or the wildfires yeah. in California or flooding across Europe, those are real costs as well. And if you look at that equation, it tells you something's out of kilter. Carbon pollution is too cheap and the solutions need the investment. OK, need. forget for the moment, even though that's what this programme is about, fiddling with nature, the engineering side of this. Uh, and what about an idea that's gathering pace, which is just to plant more trees? There's a group out there called Plant Our Planet. And um, initially they wanted to plant a billion trees uh, when it was thought that there were something like 35 million billion trees on the planet. But then it was discovered there were already 400 billion trees on the planet. So now they want to plant a trillion trees. And they're not uh, extreme. You know, they think this is doable. So that's the simplest way, isn't it? Well, uh, uh, OK, so I, I refer you back to my original point, which is all of these ideas, because we're operating at such large scales and because we only have one planet, have to be really carefully thought out. I can think of, a, 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 you know, afforestation to me and rewilding feels very good, but if I play devil's advocate, I can actually think of lots of reasons why they're not great. Uh, trees are very dark which means they absorb heat, which means if you plant the wrong trees in the wrong place, you can actually heat the planet up rather than cool it down. Uh, if you plant trees, what sort of trees are they? What does that do to biodiversity? How does that, uh, how does that feed the planet? I'm not, I'm not saying anything is right or wrong. You know, I bang the same old drum over and over again. We just need to have all of these ideas looked at honestly, dispassionately, because is that all of them have problems. what the Cambridge Institute is doing? I mean, it, it, the headline-grabbing initiatives here, like refreezing the poles by spraying water up into the clouds, stopping the heat uh, coming in, etc. That is what is being done at the moment, isn't, isn't it? Jess, Jesse, you first on that one, and then, then Mike. Well, yeah, I want to chime in and follow up on a few things that have been said, and uh, we do indeed need to have... Uh, we need to be exploring all possible reasonable avenues to fight climate change. It's an all-hands-on-deck situation. And just as we should have listened to the, uh, the first IPCC report almost 30 years ago, I think we also should have listened to a, a, an important report by the Royal Society there in London that came out 10 years ago that said that the UK government should be funding uh, geoengineering research. And they released a trickle, and uh, Matt was involved in one of those projects. Uh, but we're at, but we're at a situation where certainly on this on the side of, of solar geoengineering where we're speaking of reflecting some portion of sunlight, uh, it, it it shows that it has a lot of potential to reduce climate change. But uh, here we are still at the research stage, and and globally uh, uh, the amount of funding for this is is minimal, uh, and most of it comes from uh, from from uh, philanthropic sources, and, and and governments just haven't stepped up. Uh, and they need to. And that's in contrast, importantly, to what Angus was speaking of around carbon removal. That's something that's shown that it can be driven by the private sector and arguably should be so. I, I think there's an interesting mindset at play here, Jesse, which is, I mean, when you look at the intergovernmental panel and climate change reports, I mean, they are like the Bibles. I mean, we're on the fifth edition, unlike the Bible. But uh, these so far haven't really given serious addressing to geoengineering. The emphasis is very much on mitigation. The Committee on Climate Change in the UK it really makes an impact to the UK government. It hasn't really formally addressed geoengineering. 
And I wonder whether what we're kind of doing is holding geoengineering as a contingency. It's almost in case of real emergency, break the glass and get out some of these new technologies. And maybe it's a kind of mindset we have to deal with to make sure, as um, Matt mentioned yourself, Jesse, we have to be working these to bring down the costs if or when, mm. or perhaps we don't need it, but you know, if it is a contingency, we have to make sure they so are Somebody attractive. somewhere must be setting a, a good example. I, I've made a note here of Scandinavia, and I can't remember exactly why I did that, but I've put it down as a sort of best practices. Uh, can you help me with this one? Well, Scandinavia has lots of trees. Perhaps that was the, the reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Matt is right. You know, you can do, you can deploy any carbon solution uh, well, or you can deploy it badly, and afforestation is exactly the same. There is a massive scope for afforestation to be done in concert with improving biodiversity and locking some of that carbon up, not just in the trees, but in our homes and, and using timber. Uh, the UK is a major importer of timber in the UK, coming from some of it from Scandinavia, which is mostly sustainable, but much of it from parts of the world which, which aren't. I think one of the reasons I put it down there was because there is governmental control over what is needed, much more than there, there is here. And the note I've got underneath it, government policy should be worldwide. Similar sort of policy should be worldwide. The, the UK's got a very good um, law, the Climate Change Act, one of binding legislation that's been copied across the world now that says that gives guidance on how much we, sh we should cut uh, pollution. And the, and the Committee on Climate Change, which Angus referred to, is an expert body that gives really, really good advice on on that. They have focused primarily on cutting carbon pollution, on mitigation, um, because we all agree that's the first thing to do. And here in the UK, we're not even insulating our, our homes properly. There's some basic things we're not doing to stop this problem. That's a, that's a big concern with, with groups like Friends of the Earth when we're looking at you know, ideas about geoengineering. We're not doing the basics yet. Why okay. aren't we doing the basics? But, but the isn't, basics? isn't there a problem here? Sorry, please, in a second, if you don't mind. Um, isn't there a problem that there are a thousand different ideas out there and there's nobody actually saying this is the one we should pursue? And you can get a little bit of money thrown at it, a little bit of enthusiasm at this one, that one, the other one. Um, we really don't know what works and therefore we're just sort of fiddling around the edges. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's right. I think, I think Cambridge aren't the first to come up with this idea about um, integrated assessment. So one of the... Uh, projects Jesse referred to that was funded in 2010 was to look at all of these different things in the round but but we again we are really scratching the surface I'm, I'm slightly nervous that scientists always come onto TV and ask for more funding that's um, always questionable but I, I suppose but actually in this particular case I, I do think everything needs to be looked at and, and carefully th through an objective prism and I, and I so, so what we're getting at the moment, perhaps with Cambridge, is somebody saying, listen, we do need to narrow down what might and might not work. I, I, is that the case? Yeah, I, I think that's right. I, th I think, I think there's, there's no, there's a, there's a mantra in our field, which there's no such thing as, there's no silver bullet, right? It might be silver buckshot, but there's unlikely to be one technology that suddenly defines and, and magically, you know, turns off climate change overnight. That's unrealistic. Let's not talk about that. We're likely to look at a number of different technologies and see where they might contribute. So, uh, you know, Mike's right. Okay. Yes. Insulate yes, houses yes, for a start. I stopped you when you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to give an example where Scandinavia is the poster child of climate change, and that's the regulatory cost. So in Sweden and Norway, if you emit a tonne of CO2, you'll pay between $70 and $100 a tonne. Now, at those levels of costs, suddenly a lot of these technologies that we discuss as being in the future come into uh, the, you know, the present um, uh, commercial viability. So Norway were the first in Europe to use carbon capture and storage in 1996 because CO2 emissions cost $70 a tonne and they had a potential carbon capture and storage opportunity that costs significantly less than that. So these things happen. So as Matt's saying, I mean, rather than throw money at research for the future, once the prevailing cost of regulation, a robust price in carbon starts to emerge, it's amazing the sense of urgency, ingenuity mm. and innovation that can take place. Let, let's talk about who has a responsibility other than every single citizen on, on this planet. You worked for Shell uh, for many years. I mean, are companies such as that actually putting enough into this and alternative ideas? Because that's one of the criticisms. Yep. So generally, I think, you know, I don't think there's a, a company, an industry left that hasn't woken up to the threat of climate change. I think where you'll see a difference 
is their response at present. I think there is a progressive wing of um, particularly oil and gas companies who have started to realise the threat to their future business model and they are starting to take actions now. I think, and apologies to Jesse here, I think there's a dichotomy between what the European companies are doing and what the American companies are doing. At present, it appears some of the Europeans are trying to take the lead in terms of investing in carbon capture and storage and other technologies that are pre-commercial, even in forestry projects. And there are examples of some American companies that seem to be doubling down on... Jesse, I'd love products. to give you the chance to come back on that. We're, we're, we're out of time. Angus, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everybody for, for coming on this programme. The wild and wacky ways of saving our planets. Perhaps they're not too way out there, but time is running out, as it has done for us. I'm David Foster. Thanks for watching Roundtable. We'll see you next time.